So we're going to cover all the evolution arguments right here. We're going to cover all the evolution arguments, and I'm going to give you verses that you can use to debunk against that. And not only that, the evolution, so-called evolution proofs will prove the opposite often. It will prove the Bible. So we're going to do that. First of all, Romans chapter 1. And notice what the Bible says concerning about God's creation. We're going to read verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the what? Creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are what? Without excuse. Okay, so notice right here that according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, God tried to prove to you that according to Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that it was by him everything is created. But there, notice that it's an imprint of the creator. Did you read that? Yeah. According to that verse, all of creation is an imprint of the Creator, right? Yeah. So this proves that there is a... All of creation has something in common. It's a designer. Is that what the verse showed right there? Yeah. Right. Creation, they all share something in common, it shows, by the Creator. It shows the common Creator, common designer. Now, evolutionists, they would like to argue where they're going to use chimpanzees are 90% uh, similarity in DNA compared to humans. They're also going to take some kind of backbone structure from you where the, uh, the amount of numbers within your backbone perfectly match with some, some other animal, etc. So they're going to use basically any, bio, any organism in your body and they're going to see how it can match with an animal out there. They even went to the, uh, the birth of the fetus, and they tried to match that up with the fish and gill slits and all that back then. Back then they did that. They're probably still teaching it now. But they're, what they're trying to do is find any organism in your body that looks similar with an animal. And that will prove that we all shared a common ancestor. See, that's evolution's argument. So their argument is common ancestor. When they argue common ancestry, they're going to use certain parts. They're, remember, they're going to pick anything of God's creation in you, any organism, and they're going to try, try to find something similar with that, with a human, to prove we shared a common ancestor. But no, you can argue this way. You can argue that, no, it doesn't, it doesn't prove a common ancestor, it proves a common designer. Amen. For example, if you see a Honda Accord and a Honda Civic, am I going to stupidly teach that, you know, this Honda Civic evolved from the Honda Accord. They both share the same ancestor somewhere. No. Would you agree, though, that the similarities of the car, you know it's made by the same designer? Yeah. yeah. By the common designer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's what you're going to argue. What you can argue right there, things that are so similar only proves a common designer, not a common ancestor. And use Romans chapter 1 verse 22 to debunk that evolution argument. All right, here's another evolution argument is radiometric dating, carbon-14 dating, uranium lead, potassium argon dating, or whatever radiometric dating they will use. So radiometric dating. <clears throat> So then, what's the problem with radiometric dating? We're going to look at Psalms chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 1, please. <clears throat> We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 10. Hebrews chapter 1, and then we will read verse 10. The problem with radiometric dating you got to realize this. It doesn't matter which dating method it is, whether it's potassium argon, carbon-14, or etc. There's a problem with these dating methods. So the measurement is scientific, and how they do it, the method to doing that is smart and scientific. It's logical. But there's a problem. The problem is, is if the current fossil that they're dating, so basically radiometric dating, they'll find some kind of fossil out there, 
And then they're going to use this radiometric dating to tell you how old it is. That's the idea. Carbon-14 dating, will measure it by carbon-14 through the sunlight hitting the atmosphere, potassium argon, and uranium lead with their elements, etc. But forget all of that. The point of it is this, though. So they can measure anything from their environment to give you an accurate date. That's fine. But the problem is this. What if the environment around this fossil changed? Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Then it would change this fossil that you're dating, right? Mm -hmm. So if weather conditions, or if nobody touched the fossil to begin with, then you can date backwards. But let me ask you this question. If you add more time, let's say thousands of years, do you have a lot of faith that this object is going to be left untouched? Do you have faith in... Do you have that much faith that the environment surrounding it will always remain the same? No, right? Now let me ask, let me ask this. If we had millions of years, your faith is going <laughs> to... That's quite stretching the imagination. Yeah. You're going to have to really believe that this fossil was definitely untouched for millions of years. Look, man, how many times have you touched something with just your fingertip within just 10 years? And you have that much faith that this fossil was untouched for millions of years? See, in fact, if you pour just, uh, when they pour distilled water on some kind of uh, fossil or some object, nearly 80% of potassium argon dating was erased, just like that. Mm -hmm. Because when rainwater touches the fossil, it makes it worse. It makes things worse sometimes. So that's why if environment conditions still remain the same, constant see constant stay the same if the environment around it stays the same then it's successful but the problem is this the problem is obviously we don't believe it's constant it's not constant the bible already argued that with you and then the one of the strongest arguments is called the second law of thermodynamics. Amen. What is second law of thermodynamics, Pastor? It is the two laws that Einstein said were the most powerful in science. That's what Einstein himself said. Second law of thermodynamics is entropy. In other words, in other words, when there's a certain object or organism out there, it don't, it doesn't, uh, it, it will break apart as time passes by. It doesn't improve in condition. It de-evolves, so to speak. It breaks apart. Yeah. If you leave a car running for, let's say, 100 years, what's going to happen to the car? Going to evolve e into a Ferrari. No, it's going to get worse. It's going to turn into junk. You, you leave a bread out by itself for uh, days, what's going to happen? It's going to turn to a delicious cake. No, it's going to be something where green stuff pops out of it, and then you might throw it away. Yeah. So the thing is this, is that... That's second law of thermodynamics. Things break apart. See, when organisms come together, they always break apart more and more and more. So that's second law of thermodynamics. And the Bible predict the Bible already told you that things break apart. So the environment is not constant. The Bible told you that. The Bible told you the environment keeps changing. It becomes what? Worse and worse. Second law of thermodynamics. Hebrews 1:10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. Well, we want to date how old this rock is. Well, no, if you date the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands, they shall what? Perish. But thou what? Remainest. Only God is constant. All of creation breaks apart. And they shall all wax old at the, the garment. And a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be what? changed they change it doesn't stay constant it's, it changes but thou art the same and thy what years shall not fail uh, fa excuse me <laughs> thy years shall not fail so notice right here that as years pass by we believe that god will remain constant but as years pass by the earth is not constant yeah when you <laughs> If you're going to add millions of more years, which scientists tend to do, you're just making it worse. You're trying to, then you're, you have to increase your faith more that it was definitely remain untouched for a million more years after that. Yeah. See, that's the problem. All right, a, a third thing right here with evolution is that they believe concerning about macroevolution. 
macroevolution. Within macroevolution, there are two keys that they will always use. It's called mutation as well as natural selection. What in the what in the what, Pastor? Okay, so, uh, so basically, macroevolution means things are changing, evolving in a very big way, like a dog into a cat, like a dog into a cat, for example. Mutations is cert certain things within your gene that helps the big changes, that helps macroevolution. Natural selection is where you're adapting to your environment around you. So when your body is adapting to the environment, eventually it will hit big changes. Macroevolution, it will evolve into big changes from a dog into a cat. That's the idea. Now what's the problem with this? The problem with this is that all you have to do is ask them one simple question. Give me evidence right now of macroevolution. Amen. Now, you know what creationists believe? Creationists believe in microevolution. Now you might say, what is that? We believe there are small changes. So for example, the easiest example is after Noah's flood, how did we get many different nationalities, right? Because we're all changing within our environment. If dogs crossbreed with other dogs, guess what, it's gonna produce a different dog. But these are still small changes, it's within a dog category. It's not gonna change into a cat. So all you have to do is ask an evolutionist Give me an example of macroevolution. And guess what? They will only give you evidence of microevolution. Mm -hmm. They can never give you an example of a dog changing into a cat. Mm -hmm. They can never do that. Or a zoo. they can never prove where it changed in, into a different kind of animal. Look at Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says that it is created within their kind. Amen. So the Bible recognizes that there are differences within a kind but it will always remain a kind. We'll look at Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Notice at verse 11. And God said that the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after, after what? His kind, whose seed is what? In itself upon the earth. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after what? His kind. And the tree yielding fruit whose seed was where? In itself after his kind. Let's also read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 21. 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after what? Their kind. And every winged fowl after what? His kind. And God saw that it was good. Let's also see right here in verse 24. And God said that the earth bring forth the living creature after what? His kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after what? His kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. So notice that according to this verse, it's after his kind. And then you'll notice that in verse 12 and 11, it's in itself, right? In itself. So basically, this is the most annoying question that evolutionists really cannot answer, to be honest. Even Ray Comfort always asks him this question, and an evolution cannot answer this. Famous creationists like Ken Ham, for example, ask, ask certain professor and biologists, zoologists, give me your best example of evolution. That's all you have to do. Ask them your best example of evolution that is currently observed and experimented today. Amen. That's what you have to ask them. Amen. So we, this one is, do you know what the definition of a scientific theory is? Or a hypothesis? What it requires is observation and experimentation. Was there any such lab experiment where they created a dog into a cat? No. But you can do it with a different dog. You can do it with uh, certain plants. You can do it with certain birds and fishes. But you can't do, uh, you, this is proven, microevolution, observation, experiment. But this is not proven. 
This is fairy tale La La Land right there. So I asked them for their best example of evolution, and I guarantee you this. Make sure you specifically mention something that is observed and experimented. That you observed and experimented. Give me your best example. And guess what? They're always going to hit this. Yeah. They're never going to hit this. It says seed in itself, correct? That's what the Bible says. So it's the same information. Same genetic information. That's what the Bible showed you right there. Letters within a gene, it can, there can be things that can switch and it can be differentiated, but there's a certain pool and category that it cannot go beyond. It's going to have to remain the same information. So tell them this. Observed and experimented that provided new information. These require new information. They cannot give you one. So the Bible debunks evolution right here. All right, another category within evolution is time. Time is the magic wand of evolution. They think that when you add millions and millions of more years, and billions of more years, they can get away with it. Because, for example, if they give you an evidence of microevolution, then you're going to say, well, that's microevolution. That's not macroevolution. So you know what the evolutionist will say? The evolutionist is going to say, oh, but, you know, that's why we say millions of years, see? Mm -hmm. Because small little changes, it's going to transform into another small difference, another small difference, another small difference, and one plus one plus one plus one will eventually equal four. Add, keep adding ones and ones and ones will eventually reach equal one million. See, that's what the evolutionist is thinking. So that's why time is their magic wand. It's their getaway car. But the problem with that is that time is the enemy of evolution. Time proves the Bible. Time does not prove evolution. So number four, adding time. Proves what? It proves evolution. Uh, they're wrong. In fact, the Bible shows right here that when you add more time, what happens? It becomes worse. <laughs> Why? Second law of thermodynamics, remember? So what's the verse? Hebrews chapter 1, we read that, right? Years fail within the foundation of the earth, but only God remains the same. So you can use Hebrews chapter 1 to debunk this. Adding time just makes it worse. It disproves evolution more when you add time. It disproves evolution more when you add more time. Oh, that's why, oh yeah, we believe in little changes, but that just means that, you know, when we add millions of years, eventually it's going to hit a new information. But you tell them this, but the second law of thermodynamics, it's going to break apart even faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before this category, this little organism will meet this other little organism and say, hey, let's evolve and change into something. Second law of thermodynamics is just going to cut it off every time it does that. See, because second law is so much faster. So you got scripture to prove that. That's Hebrews chapter 1. Another scripture that you can use to debunk evolution is concerning fossils. So let's go to Genesis chapter 6, please. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. What do we believe concerning fossils? Well, what evolutionists believe is that these are eight men, or these are concerning the transitional. What do you mean by transitional, Pastor? So basically, they found fossils where it was like a half human, half monkey. So because of that, this fossil proves that monkeys eventually evolved into humans. We see that. We all shared a common ancestor somewhere. But the problem with this teaching is that when you look at Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says this, is that if we are going to argue something very strange about some kind of human fossil that looks a little bit animalistic and a little bit human, you know what we can argue right here? This actually proves the Bible more. Yeah, amen. Why? Because long time ago, the sons yeah. of God intermingled with humans, and that's why there were uh, these kind of weird-looking people that... Uh, became evolved and created, that were born. Genesis chapter 6, 
verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Look at that. There was some kind of birth that was very strange that came out with sons of God intermingling with humans. So this just proves the Bible even more. So if you see a fossil, then just tell them this. Well, there you go then. So you can now believe in aliens, Mr. Scientist. <laughs> now you can say that. <laughs> and they're going to think that you're even more wacky after that. But you see right here, this is just as wacky as well. Because if... If they're going to argue that this is proof of eight men, how do they not know that's just proof of a reptilian right there? So you, have, so you can make up anything with the fossil. Unless you have scientific evidence that prove this has to be an eight man, you don't have anything. So they don't have scientific evidences for that. They, the only way they can argue this is by the other four branches of arguments I went to. That's the only way they can justify this. So we see right here, five fossils will just e even prove Genesis chapter 6, the Bible. Okay, another thing right here is uniformity. So basically, the strata. So in other words, what they believe is this. What they believe is that in every ground, they believe the ground is laid out like this by strata. And depending upon, so let's say this is the top where we're in. Underneath us, supposedly, there are layers upon layers underneath us. So the bottom layer is supposedly the oldest layer. So when they see some kind of fossil down over here, they're going to say, oh, this is billions or millions of years old. And then if they find a fossil over here, this is not the oldest, but this is older. They're going to say, okay, this is younger than this one, but this is older than this one. So because by this strata, they can... They supposedly argue that's why we believe in evolution, because of the strata it's in. But the problem with this argument is this. The strata don't look like this. The strata looks like this. <laughs> Didn't you know there are petrified trees upside down that went through several stratas? Mm -hmm. Didn't you know that there, they found a fossil of some kind of, uh, some kind of animal giving birth, and then it was fossilized underneath? <laughs> You think it, millions of years eventually passed by where another ground covered it? No. What does this prove? This just proves Noah's flood then. Amen. Amen. So this proves Noah's flood. So then strata only proves Noah's flood. So you can use Genesis chapter 7, Genesis chapter 8, Noah's flood. So geology, strata or geology, does not prove evolution. It only proves the Bible more. If you study geology, I encourage them to study geology. So you'll see that from these following arguments of evolution, you have pure scripture that can explain away their arguments. So this is purely based off of scripture. And you'll notice that you can use scientific uh, reasoning as well as logic to argue your case right here.